Madam Ambassador, Mr. Watson, I know we speaker, friends of Ireland, know him. Today marks the 250th commemoration of the first observance of St. Patrick's Day in the United States. It took place in Boston in 1737. Kip has been at every one of the same. On this day, the uh, friends of Ireland everywhere gathered to lift a common cup to hope and to memory and to the Greenland far away, seen by some only in the eye of imagination, by others in the eye of faith, and to love no less by all of us. And to a fellowship that spans the ocean and even spans the center aisle and brings us together to join hands for the day. We heartily congratulate the new Taoiseach, Charles J. Hoy, and we look forward to working with his government to promote the prosperity of his people and peace and stability in Northern Ireland. We commend uh, most earnestly the outgoing Taoiseach, our friend Gary Fitzgerald, for his skillful statesmanship in negotiating the Anglo-Irish agreement. We firmly assert that practitioners of violence of either side who would rend the fabric of tranquility and stain with innocent blood the bands of brotherly reconciliation have no support in the United States. And on this day of reconciliation, it gives me pleasure to toast two presidents to the president of the Republic of Ireland, the Honorable Patrick Hiller. <laughs> Now permit me, please, the, uh, the very great pleasure on this day to toast uh, one who has given eloquent expression and the inspiration and leadership of his administration to the goals of enduring Anglo-Irish friendship and abiding peace in Northern Ireland, the son of an Irishman named John Reagan and president of the United States. sharing in the spirit of this magnificent day. We talk about the luck of the Irish. I got over that case of the laryngitis that was plaguing me last week just in time. <laughs> <laughs> Looking around this room, and especially when I see my old friend Tip O'Neill, I can't help but feel that we're living testimony to the notion that Irishmen love a good scrap. Some of us have been in a few of them in our day. Before we leave Washington, I'm certain we will we'll be in a few more. I remember my dear father once told me of a fellow who walked into a saloon, pounded on the bar, and said in a loud voice, show me an Irishman and I'll show you a win. And about a six and a half foot Irishman stepped forward, rolling up his shirt sleeves as he did so. He said, I'm Irish. And the fellow said, I'm, I'm a wimp. <laughs> <laughs> yes, today everyone wants to be Irish. It's gratifying to find that so many of our friends and colleagues are Irish, at least for the day. There's Sean Bird, Seamus Wright, and of course Patty O'Dole. Today is a day for good fun and infectious happiness for all Irish. I should know I've been Irish longer than almost all of you. But not all Irishmen are as witty as we would like to think. You know, there's a story of an Irishman who was 
walking down the road. He had a great sack tied over his shoulder. A wise fellow along the road says, uh, if I can guess how many potatoes you have in that sack, then I have one. And the Irishman replied, if you can guess how many potatoes in the sack, you can have both of them. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, but America has been blessed by her Irish children. One arrival earlier in this century, and I like to talk about it, was his first day in New York. A young fella, and he was start, started out across Broadway against the light. And a New York cop grabbed him and said, Where do you think you're going? Well, he said, I'm simply trying to get to the other side of the street. But when that New York cop heard that broke, he warmed right up, and he said, well, now that, he said, come back, you stay right here. He says, when the light of red turns green, he says, that's for you to go to the other side of the street. So he stood there, waiting for the light to turn green. The light turned orange for a few seconds, as they do, and then turned green. He started out, he got about 10 or 12 feet out, turned back to the cop. And he said, they don't give them better Protestants much time, do they? <laughs> St. Patrick's Day Parade in Boston was recorded as far back as 1737. It's interesting to note that during the American Revolution, it was on St. Patrick's Day, 1776, when the Irish ended their, or the, pardon me, the British ended their occupation of Boston and evacuated the city. One can only wonder if it was the American cannons on Dorchester Heights or the thought of spending during another St. Patrick's Day celebration that demoralized them so many <laughs> But seriously, though, we Americans of Irish descent can be proud of the part our ancestors played in building this great country, even from its earliest days. Ben Franklin may have been the first to note the Irish influence. In 1784, he wrote, It is a fact that the Irish immigrants and their children are now in possession of the government in Pennsylvania by their majority in the assembly, as well as of a great part of the territory. And I remember well the first ship that brought any of them over. Benjamin Franklin said that. One wonders what old Ben would say if he were to be with us at this gathering today, knowing that he was a man who loved a good time. I'm certain that he put on a shamrock and called himself Benjamin O. Franklin just for the occasion. Our forefathers and Mothers were people with a passion for liberty and justice. So today, let us remember them and live up to the great expectations they had for us and for this beloved country of ours. I came across something that is labeled as an old Irish curse or blessing. May those who love us, love us. And those that don't love us, may the Lord turn their hearts. And if the Lord doesn't turn their hearts, May he turn their ankles so they will recognize them by their limping. It's <laughs> <laughs> my privilege if you will allow me. And please do this in the Philadelphia style, which is that you only rise to toast the dead. I'm so sort of worried about your rising long ago. But um, do our guest, the Prime Minister. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, Ambassador, distinguished friends. We on Capitol Hill, surrounded by so many friends of our national day of all, and we know nowhere is it celebrated with more pride and fervor than here in the United States. And I want to express our deep appreciation to you, Mr. Speaker Wright, for organizing this very pleasant, warm, and happy gathering on of our national festival. May I say to all our American friends that I'm very glad 
we have with us also today my predecessor, Dr. Gareth Fitzgerald. There are no two countries anywhere in the wide world which have such a special relationship as all of ours. And I should particularly like to avail of this occasion to thank you, Mr. President, to thank the former speaker, Mr. Tip O'Neill, and our gracious host today, the present speaker, Mr. Wright, and all the friends of Ireland, and all our friends in Congress, for their support and encouragement of the Anglo-Irish Agreement and the International Fund for Ireland. That fund, Mr. President, that you uh, were gracious enough to inform us sign the certificate for today. We hope to enlist the support of the Friends of Ireland for other objectives which we will be pursuing in the US. We have a special concern about the status of the many thousands of young Irish immigrants who have come to this country in recent years and whose legal position is far from satisfactory. I want to personally welcome more than one quarter of a million Americans Ireland this year, and a very warm welcome awaits them, as none other than the President of the United States himself can confirm. Within the hospitality of the people, the beauty of the countryside, and all the many other attractions are there to be enjoyed. And nowhere, anywhere in the world, is the American visitor more warmly welcome or more appreciated than the <coughs> Ireland. Ireland today also offers American industry the most profitable investment location in Europe. In the period immediately ahead, the Irish government will be concentrating our efforts on economic recovery, on revitalizing the economy and aggressively pursuing investment, employment, and the creation of wealth. On this visit and subsequently, I will be extending to US business a very specific and genuine invitation to participate actively and publicly in our program of economic recovery. We will seek to direct their attention particularly to growth sectors like financial services, computer software, information technology, food processing and biotechnology, tourism, chemicals, and healthcare. I know that a visit to I have uh, never been so wonderfully impressed with the philosophy of checks and balances. <laughs> I always thought it meant, Mr. President, that if we wrote too many checks, we wouldn't have any balances. <laughs> when I was in Ireland on the 17th, or before the 17th of March, a few years ago, I brought back some shamrocks, and I planted them in a planter. They grew uh, and uh, flourished until the heat of summer came, and then they wilted. These, if they have roots, 